Um, everybody's just trying to come together and figure out what happened. Um, it's not an easy time for anybody. The University of Alabama student was last seen leaving the Gray Lady Bar on Greensboro Avenue early Sunday morning. We're, we're retracing the steps from last night. Um, and, and trying to locate him. Tuscaloosa Police Chief Brent Blankley says Walker was reported missing after his cell phone was found near the river walk. According to his parents, this is what Walker was wearing the last time anyone saw him. We have reason to believe that we believe he is more than likely in the Black Warrior River. Um, we retrieved some clothing items that led us to believe this. For more than 10 hours, dive crews have been trying to find Walker in the water using drones and sonars. Tuscaloosa Fire Chief Randy Smith says crews have run into some issues because the water is so deep. When you're up in five, six foot deep, you know, you're able to see a little bit. It's murky. Once you get below eight to 10 feet, it's, it's total blackout. So, you know, they're, they're going by hand, try to feel what's going on. Chief Smith says crews will be back out on the river at daybreak to continue. Gracie Johnson joins us live. Gracie, you were at that vigil. What can you tell us? Tamika, tonight, Bama Catholic held a candlelight vigil to honor and pray for Garrett Walker. The vigil was held at St. Francis Catholic Church, where Garrett's friends and members of the church came together to remember him. The service began with praying the rosary and was followed by praise and worship music. All students were welcome to attend. George Todd, a member of Bama Catholic Leadership Board, shared why the church felt it was so important to hold this vigil. To pray for them, that their sufferings and pains that they might be experiencing right now as they're cleansed and purified on their way to heaven, those might be lessened. Um, and that we could just pray for them during this time and be with them. Family and friends, Kelsey, are understandably shaken up by this. Yeah, Nicole, well, friends, family members, they have so many questions as to what happened. They say Garrett Walker was last spotted early Sunday morning, leaving a bar after a day filled with college football. His body was found two days later in a river. A community left heartbroken after 20-year-old Garrett Walker was found dead in a river in Alabama. My roommate's girlfriend was really good friends with him. And it's just like heartbreaking to see how she is like on a daily basis after this tragedy has happened. Walker is from Mount Airy and was a student at the University of Alabama. He was last seen on Sunday morning at a bar in downtown Tuscaloosa. His cell phone and some of his clothing items were found along the Black Warrior River Bank. Search crews used three boats to search the area and deployed drones and underwater sonar to find him. They discovered his body on Tuesday. We have positively identified the victim. Uh, he was recovered by divers. Uh, family has been notified. Uh, we've also notified the students. So we're not going to take any questions at this time because this is an ongoing investigation. At this firm, never get callous to the fact that we're dealing with people's lives on their very worst day. But yesterday is unlike anything I've ever seen. The family's attorney, Josh Hayes, held a press conference on behalf of the Walkers, thanking the city of Tuscaloosa, first responders, and the University of Alabama community for their support since Garrett's disappearance. The university was absolutely amazing um, from the jump on this. They, they were quick to offer help to the family. They were quick to offer help to the fraternity brothers um, and friends of Garrett's that you saw piled up on that hill for a couple of days. Student Life even brought out folding chairs and tarps for them to have a place to sit comfortably. There was food provided, coffee, donate, donuts, um, you know, everything you could hope for to support the student community. I think our university did it, and I'm awful proud to be an alum. We know he attended the Alabama LSU football game Saturday night and was with friends after at the Gray Lady, a local bar on Greensboro Avenue. Walker was last seen alive around 1.15 a.m. Sunday morning. But what happened after that? That's the question his loved ones and investigators are trying to figure out. Anyone who was in the area uh, the night uh, that Garrett went missing, we need to hear from them. If you have information, please reach out. You can reach out to us here at our firm. We'll be sure to get you in touch with the police too. Um, if you saw something, if you think you may have saw something that you're just not sure about, uh, it's kind of the, the adage, see something, say something. We need the public to speak up. Just 24 hours after Garrett Walker's body was pulled from the Black Warrior River, his family is on their way back home to Maryland with his Jeep and his dog Gunner. As they left Tuscaloosa today, they told their attorney Josh Hayes they have just one wish. 
Garrett lived a lot of life in his 20 years, and we do not want him remembered for the way he died. We want him remembered for the way he lived. He was an incredible young man. His parents are very proud of him. Uh, his mother said it best that um, she's going to remember Garrett as a young man of faith. Uh, they told a story yesterday of uh, a tattoo on his uh, body that, that uh, his father wasn't pleased with, but he was pleased with the content of it. It was Joshua 1-9. And um, that, that, that family is going to be special to me going forward for sure. story that I want to talk about today in regards to 20-year-old Garrett Walker, who was a missing University of Alabama student who went missing November 7th of last year. I wanted to tie his case into a familiar case. The story of the smiley face killers, that particular theory, that story of all the young college, young men who were college students who were found in bodies of water or near bodies of water. And so when I came across Garrett's story, it reminds me a lot of that particular theory, that particular story story um well stories because there's a number of young men who have been um again like i said found in bodies of water or near bodies of water and there's always a smiley face near and um so this story made me think about is it possible that this is happening again that the whoever these smiley face killers are that or a killer that they're resurfacing there's been a couple of stories um and uh, as you can see earlier in the year in regards to the young man jelani day who went missing same around the same time gabby petito did and um how he was found in a body of water but his story was a little different all right moving along and getting to Garrett Walker's case. Now, Garrett Walker went missing on November 7th, and he um, was going to school to be in um, engineering. He was a junior. So, um, Garrett was also a member of a fraternity there on campus delta chai fraternity or delta chi the last time garrett was seen was when he was leaving the gray lady bar in tuscaloosa around 1 15 a.m that sunday so the same day november 7th 2021 now later on that sunday afternoon garrett's cell phone was located near the Tuscaloosa's Riverwalk and his parents reported him missing following the discovery of the phone. Now there was a search for Garrett police search for him and that was later found some clothing of his that was located in the Black Warrior River and um, the police so because of that the police went ahead and searched the river and around and this was two days after he was reported missing so around what do they say later on about 4 p.m tuesday evening november 9th garrett's body was discovered in the river now autopsy i was trying to find autopsy results although the police said that they believe there was no foul play involved they're not saying if they believe it's a suicide but even if they said it was that would be really weird because he was dr out drinking the night before and i don't know how that would lead to him taking off his clothes and jumping in a river to kill himself it just doesn't make sense so I don't know exactly where the police is getting the no foul play from. Also, I couldn't find anything about released in regards to an autopsy. So it seems like the case is still open and they're trying to still follow some leads. I know the family, they went ahead and hired a private investigator to go ahead and investigate the case. 
see what they can come up with because this is very strange and in this video i'm going to cover the smiley face killer theory and um you can see if there's any connections in regards to Garrett Walker's case. But I believe that this could be one of those killings. Across the country disappeared only to be found dead, all of them supposedly accidentally drowning after a night on the town. Then an investigative reporter in Minnesota linked the murder of a local student to dozens of deaths coast to coast. That reporter, Christy Peel of ABC Station in Minneapolis, KSTP, is here with more. Good morning, Christy. Good morning. Thanks, Robin. Chris Jenkins was a popular college student who simply vanished. Four months later, he was found dead. First, Minneapolis police thought Chris Jenkins was just a drunk college kid who accidentally fell into the Mississippi River. Then, they said he was murdered. That finding was the turning point in an investigation that now calls into question the cause of death in more than 40 cases. Call it a mystery or a sick trademark of the perfect crime. At least 40 men over 11 years, their cause of death, drowning, all blamed on a drunken accident, except one. You should, you should let Grandpa take control. I know. Chris was abducted in a cargo van. He was driven around Minneapolis for hours and tortured. The death of Chris Jenkins in Minneapolis is the only one where the cause of death was changed from undetermined drowning to homicide. No, not, not, not. Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte are the retired cops who say they've discovered a link between Jenkins' death and the drownings of at least 40 other men in 25 cities in 11 different states. This all started in New York City 11 years ago. That's when then Sergeant Kevin Gannon made a promise to the parents of the young man he found right here. We knew it wasn't suicide and it was just, um, you know, one of those things where he walked out and then was never seen again. Jackie and Pat McNeil's oldest son, Patrick, was last seen in a New York City bar. His body found 50 days later. It's something you live to learn to live with, to learn to live with a broken heart. It is almost a perfect crime. Perfect, they say, because the water washes away physical evidence and there are never witnesses. Most of the men are last seen by friends leaving a bar or college party. Local police departments have investigated. Even the FBI took a look at the drownings. In every case, except Jenkins, law enforcement ruled the deaths, drunken accidents. It can't be a coincidence or coincidences. While most local investigations focused on where a body was recovered, Gannon and Duarte wanted to know where the body went in. If they could figure out that location, the detectives believe they'd find their crime scene. In city after city, at that crucial spot, they say they'd find this symbol, a smiley face. They found one in Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Indiana, and in Iowa. They all look different, but the detectives are convinced it's the killer's sick signature. In Michigan, near a drowning, the detectives discovered graffiti they believed was written by the killers, but were puzzled by a word they hadn't seen before. We found Cincinnati, which tells us was very uh, suspicious at the time. The detectives found it again, hundreds of miles away. They were in Iowa, investigating the drowning of 24-year-old Matt Krasicki. Bloodhounds tracked his scent to an intersection near the Mississippi River. The detectives believe that is the location where the killer slid Kruziki in the water. It's Cincinnati Avenue. And we believe they were specifically leaving a clue for us or anybody who was paying attention to these drowning cases that the cases were ultimately linked. The people that murdered Chris have murdered before him and they've also murdered people after him. And those people are still at large. And joining us now is Anthony Duarte and Kevin Gannon, the two retired NYPD detectives who, along with Christy, who brought us this story, are on the trail of the serial killers. Christy, in Minneapolis, Chris Jenkins' death was ruled an accident. So what made you dig deeper? A lot of things just didn't make sense. And the Jenkins, Chris Jenkins' parents, Steve and Jan Jenkins, really have been fighting this entire time and said, you know what, our son would not commit suicide. He would not just jump over a bridge into the Mississippi and they were the ones that continued to fight. A lot of people when seeing this when we're talking about this they were, they were wondering have these victims been women? Would it be different? Would the, the, and the investigation into it would have been, uh, would have been different? 
that's something a lot of people have talked about and absolutely I think it would have I think that if we would not be to 40 and be now talking about this case I think this would have been a national story many years ago Kevin we are at 40 now uh, what, what is the common link what makes you think they're related well besides the fact that the uh, we have different evidence that we've went to the scenes when we first started um, you know, most of the cases are very suspicious with drowning cases. They're very difficult to solve. Um, we're not here to knock law enforcement. They mm -hmm. did basically an excellent job. They have no trauma on the body. It, it, it wasn't suspicious to them as it was in my three cases in New York initially back in 1997. But when the pieces didn't start fitting, we had to look at something else. And Anthony and I then started to find out what was going on. And what we tried to do is find out where the victims would have entered into the water, which would give us a better perspective of what possibly happened to them. What possibly happened to them, that's what many people uh, want to, to, to know now. And, I mean, how did you know? How did you know? To, 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 how did you put the pieces together when so many people apparently couldn't? We looked at the totality of the cases. Um, we started with the big number and worked down, whereas the law enforcement looked at each case right. individually, whatever jurisdiction it was, and we made sure we secured the scene where we feel they went in the water, not where they were just found. And gentlemen, do you think one killer, uh, more than one killers, p perhaps? More than one. Why, what makes you think that? Um, only because there's such a uh, wide uh, range of uh, stages that the, the killings are through, all these drownings, besides the fact that we have uh, multiple of victims on the same night so uh, unless you can dispel the fact that the uh, that one of the cases drownings were not connected then there's no way that the, the same uh, perpetrator could be in two different locations at the same time separated by, by like 400 to 600 miles Anthony what possibly could could be the motive well that's something that we really can't get into detail right now because we're hoping for a prosecution still uh, some people want to know why why go public now? Why are you bringing this information to the forefront now? I know you're not revealing a lot of information, but but why go public? Because right now, um, really, we're out of finances, and we really can't do any more on the cases. In fact, that we um, we looked at 89 cases in totality. Um, we knocked out 30 right away, and um, there was 19 cases that we haven't even done yet. And out of those 19. They look like at least you know 10 to 15 of those could be connected, but we got 40, and we figured at this point, from the information that we have at the scenes, the fact that this same pieces of evidence keep showing up over and over again at the at the spots where we determined through our investigative skills that the bodies entered the water. At that point, we said we have to go forward to at least alert the public, the families, and to, to protect their children. To protect the children. So who should really? Because many of them are they're male. Right. Uh, college students? Correct. Athletic? Yes. What else should be, you know, people should be aware of and so they can be a little more diligent? Well, high grade point averages. Right. Mm -hmm. Very high. And they it's somehow get separated. They're alone and they get separated from their friends and that's when this happens. That's when friends they disappear. The Duquesne University graduate student for two years. Officially, his death was ruled an accident. But there are now questions about whether he was killed by serial killers known as the Smiley Face Killers. It has been just over two years since this security camera caught the last image of 23-year-old Dakota James alive. So there are days you have to learn to put a smiling face on because I've got other people in my life, you know, and I've got to be braver. Dakota would want me to be brave. Pam James is Dakota's mom. He wouldn't want me to be a victim. He'd say, Pam, now it's time to stop that. Let's out. And that's all I'm trying to do, is to figure it out. Pam says she has to push the emotions of mom aside when it's time for Detective Pam to go to work looking for answers. I knew we had plans for the weekend. I knew the last time I talked to him, he was very upbeat, getting ready to start his new set of college classes. Just gotten a raise, just gotten a bonus. 
But Dakota James didn't make it to that weekend. On January 25th, 2017, he left friends in this nightclub strip on Liberty Avenue and headed for home on the north side, walking through Katz Plaza, where this final picture was taken, and then down the alley towards Fort Duquesne Boulevard. We can't tell whether he goes left or he goes right. The official theory? He crossed Fort Duquesne Boulevard and went down the steps from the Clemente Bridge to urinate. The evidence seems to indicate that he may have fallen into the water. In that time of year with the, you know, with the water temperatures, you only have a couple minutes is probably a long shot, but you don't, you don't have much time before you go into shock and that's the end of that. When Pam James got the call that her son was missing. I believed that Dakota was in trouble when we found out. I never in my wildest dreams believed that he would have walked across that river to go down to it to pee and would have accidentally fallen in. I just knew that something had happened. The Jameses temporarily moved from their home in Frederick, Maryland to Pittsburgh to spearhead searches and plead with authorities to do more. Five days after he was last seen, police accepted the missing persons report. I honestly think Dakota was picked up when he uh, came out of the alley there at Scott's place. And she learned from one of Dakota's friends. He possibly was drugged and someone had tried to abduct him six weeks before. I believe he was drugged, like all our other victims, abducted off the street, held for a period of time before they killed him, and then he was placed into the water. Retired New York City police detective Kevin Gannon leads a group of investigators looking into a series of mysterious deaths of young men who disappear and are later found in a body of water. They've dubbed them the work of the Smiley Face Killers, since Smiley Face Graffiti is found near where the bodies disappeared or are found. Dakota James's body was found in the Ohio River near the Neville Island Bridge 40 days after he disappeared. Very little decomposition, um, externally or internally. It does not look like a body that has been in the water for a little shy of seven weeks. At the request of Detective Gannon and the James family, renowned pathologist Dr. Cyril Wecht reviewed the autopsy findings, which had concluded an accidental drowning. There's no way the body could have traveled 10 miles through a dam, 40 days, and been that pristine. Something would have been torn. There was no scratch marks on his face or his hands. It's impossible. And I've seen hundreds of these cases, so I'm telling you, it, 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 it doesn't make sense. On that Monday that Tommy was missing, I just was frantic. You know, those were like the worst two weeks of my life. You know, just not, not knowing. When did you guys first talk to the search? Did you guys ever go up there and look behind yes. there? Yeah, I know Tommy wasn't there for more than 24 hours because his co-worker had walked up and down that creek the day before. What was your friend's name that did that? Uh, um, Bill. Bill? Yeah. So what did Bill tell you? He just said that he he, he walked up and down the, the banks and he was like, and you know, he wasn't up top at the top of the bank. He was down at the water line and he just like walked up and down. He didn't see anything. He went up and down and there was no sign of Tommy. Right. And then the next day, then they found the body. Yeah. We found Tommy in the creek, and I knew in my gut he was going to be found in that creek. And then I just kind of lost it. That was my little boy, and it was just really hard to even process that. And to me, it, it's still like right there. It's like it happened yesterday for me. I want to know what happened. I, you know, you need that closure. It's hard. I still cry every day. Tommy worked directly for me for four years. I do interior contracting. Okay. We got along great. He never didn't call in. He never didn't answer his phone. Would you consider him one of your closest, closer friends at that point? Yes, at that point, yeah. Really? He uh, came to my daughter's birthday parties. What did your family think of Tommy? He thought he was a good kid. Yeah. As the time got closer to Tommy's passing, I'm trying to pin down what type of frame of mind Tommy was in on those days. It's like his mind was preoccupied. He didn't know who his real friends were. 
he had told me that he contacted one of his uncles and he was thinking about getting away for a while. Did you ever meet any of his friends? I did meet a couple of his friends. They were all from Richardson Park. It was a hard neighborhood. There were cliques. You were either in the clique or you weren't. Anybody that got outed uh, did not fare well. He mentioned that some of these guys were getting into uh, basically underworld stuff a little deeper than he was comfortable with. I personally think that he had some involvement, if it was minimal, even social. I think he had some involvement that he wanted out of. Have you ever heard any mention of smiley face killers here? It's an organized group that are into other act criminal activity. That's I didn't know that part. Oh yeah, that's, that's how they fund themselves. That's how gangs operate. We know this. Illegal groups, gangs, fund themselves by selling drugs, selling guns, and theft. Harry, mm -hmm. if, if, if you have more specific stuff, now's the time to get it out because it's not going to affect Tommy anymore. Right. Tommy's gone a long time. Right. And we're trying to right this wrong. Right. Because you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. So if you know more specifics, please don't keep it in. Let it out. Tommy had had conversations with me about them getting deeper and deeper into doing things like guns and drugs. Okay. So that, um, that was conversations we absolutely had. Okay. Okay. You know, it's certainly common for guys to have nefarious friends and not necessarily to go in as deep as their friends are going. Was Tommy making money off the drugs and guns? I don't think so at all. I get people that ask me on a regular basis, has anything been found out? Has anything been solved? But nobody believes it was an accident. Nobody. He couldn't have stumbled in and drowned. It's just not possible. In Obenhall Lake in Casnovia Township in 2005, the Sheriff's Department ruled the death of Todd Gibbs an accidental drowning. But tonight, hundreds of his friends and family gathered at a park to put pressure on the prosecutor's office to reopen the case. 24 Hour News 8's Crystal Hilliard joins us live there now with this part of the story. Crystal? Mark, the rally here is just now wrapping up in Conklin Park. There were hundreds of people here earlier really just coming in support of the family. Now, the family here was passing these letters out in honor of Todd Guy. What they want the MSP to do is to reopen this investigation, and this is a letter for everyone to sign and mail into the lieutenant with Michigan State Police. Now, seven years ago, Todd Guy went missing after a party. He left for home on foot. Police searched by land, by boat, and air for him for three weeks. His body was found in Open Hall Lake and his death was ruled an accidental drowning. Now, we told you back in 2008 about his family believing he was murdered as part of a Midwest killing spree. In those 90, in those 90 separate cases, the, kid, the killers left a smiley face behind. And for more on this, I am joined now with his mother, Kathy. Kathy, thank you so much for being with us here today. Talk to me. You've done a lot of research on this. A lot, a lot has gone into this. Talk to me about where you stand now. Well, um, after we plan this rally, uh, the Michigan State Police have agreed to meet with us tomorrow morning. So we're in to look at what we have. So we're hoping that they haven't promised us anything, but they will look. So we're hoping that that is fruitful. What is your goal here? What are you trying to accomplish? We are most definitely trying to accomplish that. The facts we have and the forensics we have, that this case is opened and investigated. Albany, New York. A smiley face painted in white, staring back at us. What do you see here? What I see is uh, a circle, two eyes, a nose, no mouth, but it clearly represents a smiley face. Bill Sostak believes this smiley face was left behind by someone who killed his son. 21-year-old Joshua Sostak's body, washed up in the Hudson River. Is he the latest victim of the smiley face killers? Retired detectives Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte came to find out. They believe a gang of killers may have murdered as many as 40 college-aged men in nearly a dozen states, leaving these six miles as their trademark. Tell me what you believe is happening to these students. I believe that these young men are being abducted by individuals in the bars, um, taken out, and uh, 
at some point, even held for a period of time, before they are entered into the water. The murders, they say, are staged to look like drownings. Each has been ruled accidental. Case closed. Do you think it's possible all of these drownings around the country could be a coincidence? I find it uh, ironic that so many young college-age males that fit the same profile wind up in a river from a night out. Bill says his son drank a few beers that night, but at 220 pounds, would not have been so drunk he'd wander into the water. Why would the killer or killers put the bodies in the water? Detective Duarte says water makes it the perfect crime. It makes it look like a drowning instead of a murder. And it erases key evidence, such as fingerprints or hair fibers, so the killer can't be identified. Gannon and Duarte work the cases backwards. Instead of looking at where the body was found, they use GPS and study river flow and water levels to figure out where the body went in. That's the crime scene, they say, and that's where the smiley faces have been found. What kind of person would do that? Someone not good in school, someone um, obviously not smart, maybe doesn't have a job, maybe he's not popular. So jealousy possibly could be a motive? Deep down, deep down. Kevin Gannon won't discuss the cases in detail, but says he believes three of the victims were held for hours and maybe abused. The fear of death is just as important as the act of death itself. The FBI has its doubts. The Bureau told us, to date, we have not developed any evidence to support links between these tragic deaths or any evidence substantiating the theory that these deaths are the work of a serial killer or killers. What do you believe in your heart happened to your son that night? He was murdered. Coincidence or killing spree? Sergeant Gannon, who has put in so much time investigating this with his team, says they have also concluded three other suspicious deaths of young men found in the water were homicides. Now, in one case here in New York, the investigators say the young man was stalked, drugged, tied to a chair, and tortured before his body was slipped into the water. They hope to convince federal authorities to look at these cases further. Don? All right, thank you very much for that, Randy Kay. We're going to uh, dig deeper inside of this because joining me tonight is Christy Peel in Minneapolis and uh, Bill Sostak is in Albany, New York. Christy is an investigative reporter. She broke the smiley face killer story the same week that Josh Sostak, Bill's son, was buried. The two worked independently over the summer and Bill believes his son was a victim of the so-called smiley face killer. Thank you both for joining us. Um, yeah, Thank you. I want to ask you this, Christy. First of all, let's get this out there because I think this is the crux of this new information. This surveillance video that you managed to get a hold of, we're going to play it and I want you to tell us what we're seeing on it. Can we roll that and then we'll talk to Christy about what it is. What you see in the highlighted area here, do you believe that this is Josh, right? Is that what police believe? Yes. Without a doubt, based on what he's wearing, based on the inside video, and you see him walking out, it's absolutely Josh. Give us Sostak. the circumstances. He's walking out of a bar. He's walking out of a bar. We had seen him inside. He had had a few drinks. He was standing fine. And all of a sudden, he will grab onto his knees. He heaves. He, it's like a hot flash hits him. He, he tries to take off his clothes. And then he stumbles around. And it's like he doesn't know where he is. And he's in his hometown. It would appear just from looking from the video, and it's just from the video I'm saying this, maybe he was slipped something. Uh, do you believe that, Mr. Sostak? Without a doubt without a doubt. How, how do you think this helps police um, with, with your son's killing? Are, do you think they're taking this seriously? Are they looking into this to your satisfaction? No, the Albany Police Department closed this case uh, with hours after his autopsy, even before the uh, toxicology reports were back. Uh, they feel as though that this is a tragic death, uh, that it was an accidental drowning, and as they stated, any, any other conclusion is to further gain. Uh, they never even looked at the surveillance video from the bar that we're looking at right now. What are you, um, what are you hearing from the police department, Christy? 
Excuse me? What are you hearing from the police department? You know, the police department hasn't commented about this case except to call it a tragic accident. I think that what tragic, what's tragic here is that the Zostak family, like so many other families out there, doesn't have answers and goes to sleep every night not knowing what happened to their son. Clearly, something happened to Josh Zostak. He ended up two miles away from this location in the opposite direction of where he was staying that night, where his car was, and he's not seen on any other surveillance video. I don't know how he could have gotten there unless someone else took him to the water's edge. Mr. Zostak, have you heard from anyone who's in this crowd when you're looking at the surveillance video, anyone who was with your son that night that offers you, offers you any hope uh, about what might have happened to him? Talking to the six boys who were with my son that night, and when they looked at the surveillance video, they said the reaction of Josh out in front of the bar was not Josh inside the bar. That was a total different reaction, and they feel the same as everybody else, that he was given some sort of a drug. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Mr. Zostek, we, you, we appreciate you joining us. We know it's very tough for you. Uh, and Christy, the investigative reporter who uncovered the story, thank you both for joining us, and we hope that this does offer uh, some hope to the Zostaks and some help with police uh, in figuring out what's going on with these deaths. Phew of the many, many cases that could possibly be Smiley face killer case. Because of not knowing exactly if it's a gang of people doing this, if it's one person, you know, no one knows the bodies are showing up in different cities, period of things going on that sometimes don't match, but, but possibly could be one of the cases so it's very confusing and hard to identify but it's my prayer that if this is the case that like the detectives believe that it's a group of people going out and committing these crimes that they are revealed and that the families receive justice mm -hmm.